I see the Zoom room is filling up. It is just before the noon hour on Tuesday. It's time for our virtual speaker series. Welcome everybody. Let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from today. We have a great program lined up for you. Brian Egan is with us. He's an assistant teaching professor of equine science and the coordinator of the Penn State Horse Barn. I'm gonna to talk to you about our quarter horse program that we have here at Penn State. Again, let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from. I see the chats coming in. Jim and Crystal Lake, Illinois and Diane and Berks County Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. And Polly from Mechanicsburg and Sharon from Glenside. Hope everybody's taking a break from shoveling all that snow that we got to join us on our virtual speaker series here presented by the Penn State Alumni Association. I see Eric from San Diego. He's not messing with any snow. And Marilyn, Marilyn Farley probably doesn't have snow down in Savannah, Georgia either. Jane from Carlisle, Deb from Lancaster County, Zoe from Emmaus, welcome to the virtual speaker series. Oh, the Robs from Mozambique. Look at that, back to back international. Uh, the Robs in Mozambique and Bernice Marks in Mazatlan, Mexico. Janice from North Carolina, Jane from Rochester, welcome in. We have a great program lined up for you today. Brian Egan's with us from the Penn State Quarter Horse Program. He's going to talk to you about that great program here at Penn State. And we will be getting started in just a minute. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom video window, and then clicking show subtitle. You may also customize your caption view by clicking the stream text link posted in the chat. We're live streaming today's presentation and this live stream has been made possible through the gracious support of a donor and the Fund for Access Ideas and Audacious Goals. Today's presentation will be archived and available on our website after the event. This afternoon, we welcome Brian Egan, who will discuss the quarter horse herd at Penn State, the facilities that we currently have and the way we use the horses to teach students about horse production and management. Time permitted, we'll also touch on their use and extension and research. Brian Egan is an assistant teaching professor of equine science and the coordinator of the Penn State Horse Barn. He teaches horse production and management, horse handling and training, equine marketing, broodmare and foal management, and horse selection and judging. He has worked with Penn State's quarter horses for over 30 years. Additionally, Professor Egan coaches Penn State's intercollegiate horse judging team and is an advisor for the collegiate horsemen at Penn State. Welcome, Professor Egan. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Paul. I uh, appreciate the introduction and I'm very happy to be here with everybody today. Uh, very excited to, to see how many people signed up. Um, interesting to listen to where everybody's from. I, I, I guess I wasn't expecting that. And uh, that's, that's really neat to have people not only all across this country, but in others as well. Uh, so as Paul said, we're going to talk a little bit about our horse program. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you, uh, we can start this presentation. <clears throat> So just to give a short history too, a little bit more information about me. I actually was a student at Penn State. I graduated in 87 um, 
in the animal production major at the time. I was also fortunate to not only work at the horse farm as an undergraduate student, but also live at the barn. There's housing uh, for a limited number of students. And um, through that, I really developed a passion not only for uh, the, the horses at Penn State, but Penn State in general. And I think we can all agree that once you've come here, you never want to leave. And I was fortunate enough not to really have to. Um, <clears throat> but that's not why we're here. The Penn State's been raising American quarter horses on campus for a very long time. Um, the quarter horse is an American breed, and it's an, it's an interesting breed. Um, we started... Um, raising them, there it is, okay. We began quarter horses on campus in 1955 um, with actually a, a yearling stallion that we bought from Michigan State University. Um, and it was interesting, the, the first two land grant institutions working together to help us get started in the quarter horse business. We went with quarter horses at the time because it was, uh, it was the number one breed in the state, number most popular breed in the country, but also uh, it was the breed that, <clears throat> was being used in the livestock judging contest at the time at the national level. So it was, it was a, allowing us to train our livestock judging teams with quarter horses. Quarter horses work extremely well for our program because of their size and their temperament. Um, and it's just easier for our students to work with. Um, we began breeding quarter horses in 1961 and in 2010 received the legacy award from the American Quarter Horse Association for registering at least one foal for 50 consecutive years. Uh, it's a rather prestigious group, not too many people are in that list. And in fact, I just received a certificate not too long ago with a 60 year uh, award for breeding quarter horses. So we're very fortunate to have you know, had that opportunity throughout the years. Um, one of the things that I think is most important about our, our horses is that yeah, they're here and they're nice animals and everything like that, but with our animal science program, so much of what our students need to know is, is real and it's hands-on. And having the opportunity to have horses on campus um, gives our students critical experience in the real world. Um, so, you know, to have this long-standing tradition is great and everything, but it really truly allows us to educate our students. Um, one of the things when I took over the breeding program and uh, 2003, I believe it was, um, was to try to produce the highest quality horses that we could uh, so that our students could interact with some of the highest quality breeders and producers in our industry. Uh, and that's where we've kind of strived. When I was a student here, we were extremely well known. The horse on the screen right now is a horse called Skip Sue. He was a stallion. He was a 1969 stallion, um, and he came to Penn State in 1971, I think. Anyway, from out west in Colorado, Hank Weiskamp's farm. He was the foundation of our program. Prior to him, we were fortunate enough to have outstanding horses, horses like Poco Shade and Rebel Sir and Josie's Tiempo. Um, that yearling stallion that I told you about originally, his name was Sorrel Chief. Uh, and we can go on and on and on and talk about the uh, the different stallions that have been in our breeding program over the years. Um, but let's jump ahead just a little bit to, 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 to today's point. Um, we still have stallions on the farm and these are the stallions that we use today to not only breed our own mares, but to breed outside mares. And last year we bred, we bred approximately between our four outside breeding stallions, we bred approximately 75 outside mares. One stallion that we got in 2017 is this uh, horse, his name is Red, White and Good. He's a world champion producer and a really nice animal that uh, we're fortunate to have. He was donated to us. Um, and he actually was donated to replace a stallion that we had raised here that uh, had, a, had an accident and had to be euthanized. <clears throat> Irish is his barn name and his baby, his first crop of babies that we had born here are just two year olds now. So we're just starting to work with them and we're pretty excited about their future. Another stallion that we got is one and only, his barn name is Uno. Uh, he was donated to the program last year from some people in New Jersey. Um, and he, his first foals will be arriving at Penn State this spring. He's had a lot of offspring before he came here, 
but his first Penn State babies will be arriving. In fact, his first foals due February the 20th, so we're anxiously awaiting that. Um, he's, he's a world champion producer, and when he was being shown, he was fifth in the world or in the top five at the world in the Western Pleasure, um, and we're very fortunate to have the, his quality of breeding. Another stallion that we stand and we own is his name is PSU. He rocks the night. Uh, he was actually born at Penn State. Um, he was um, the result of a donated breeding. We had some local supporters of our program that purchased a breeding um, to a horse called Gunner Special Knight. And Gunner Special Knight was a two time World Equestrian Games gold medalist, reigning horse, 2010 United States Equestrian Team Horse of the Year. Uh, and these folks bought a couple of breedings to that stallion, donated them to the university for us to use on our mares. And this is one of the resulting offspring. He's a reigning horse, so he's a little bit more, honestly, he's probably closer in line to the horses of the, the 1960s and 70s that we had at Penn State that were more cow work horses and athletic, um, old, not old fashioned, but you know, more working type horse. And then we have a horse on the property, uh, One Hot Crimson. This is the only stallion that we have that does not belong to Penn State. Um, he actually belongs to some folks in Ohio that donated the Red, White, and Good horse. Uh, and they are, they're, they're big supporters of our program. And when we had the opportunity to stand this stallion for them, we jumped at it. This is a three-time world champion Western Pleasure stallion. He's the only horse in the AQHA breed to ever win all three levels of the world championship in the Western Pleasure. He won it as a two-year-old, he won it as a three-year-old in the junior division, and he won the senior division as a six-year-old. Only, only horse, let alone stallion, to have ever done that. This stallion is number three on the all-time leading breeders list for AQHA, or at least he was the last I looked. He's actually number one uh, on the breeders list in Germany, so he's not only nationwide, he's worldwide. And we, we ship a lot of semen by this stallion all across the country. And uh, there's frozen semen that they store in Europe for European distribution. Talk about an exciting time for our students. Whenever our students go to the farm and they can handle this guy or just see him, um, it's amazing that they have that opportunity when they go out into the industry and um, on their resume, they've led one hot crimson into the breeding shed or something like that. It, it truly is something that uh, allows them to feel very special uh, here at Penn State. Along with the stallions, of course, we have a bunch of brood mares. Um, I'd have to go count them today, you know, and, and it's kind of a running joke at the farm. Somebody says, how many mares do you have? And it's then the answer is, well, it depends. Are you going to tell our boss? But uh, I think there's about 28 right now, and there might be 27 or 29 either way. Um, we try to have about 20 foals born per year. So in order to have that, you know, you've got to maintain a herd of about 24 brood mares to have 20 of them uh, be successful. Uh, and then we have a group of mares that we don't breed anymore that are either older mares or are really good for our teaching program. So we have some mares that we keep just to teach students how to uh, learn how to palpate mares and inseminate and go through the breeding process. And we're extremely fortunate uh, we've received donations of mares that are um, world champion mares, mares that have, you know, been shown for years and years and years and very successful careers. And when they're done being shown, um, the people in the industry, they, they either don't want to sell them or they can't sell them for the amount of money they have in them. So they want to see them have babies. And if they donate them to us, we have really good stallions and they can benefit from a tax write off, to be honest. Unfortunately, right now we're so full, I'm actually turning some donations away because you know, the quality and the numbers are so high. I just love this picture. You know, this is a very common, what you would see at our farm, you know, probably on a day like today, our horses are outside as much as possible. Um, and our mares are always in good shape and you know, they stand out in that cold and you can tell these two mares, this is an older picture, but these two mares are pretty heavy and full um, and they, you know, winter time, getting ready to have their babies for that year and just absolutely loving life, to be honest. If you drive around Center County, you know, 
people oftentimes see our horses up in pastures around down below the stadium or over between uh, the stadium and the highway going towards the village. Um, we try to keep our horses out and people can see them from all over and it really makes for some pretty, some pretty scenery around campus. So the part that people really love about our program oftentimes is the foals. And again, like I said, we try to have about 20 foals born per year. We use the stallions that I showed you earlier. We also sometimes breed to other stallions. Um, we have some people that will donate breedings to their really top notch world champions type stallions from all over the country. Um, and then we'll use that semen in our mares to try to produce really, really well bred and, and hopefully <laughs> expensive babies. This is just a group of foals from there. Actually, this is a group of foals that we're gonna be selling this spring at our annual student run sale. Um, and we're fortunate, a lot of these pictures that we see, you know, we're fortunate to have some alum that are extremely good photographers. One of our alumni is a professional horse photographer and she's kind of our official photographer to come in and take pictures. Uh, the pictures that are on the screen now, we're gonna talk a little bit about clubs, but the Collegiate Horsemen Association at Penn State Every year they have a, one of their main fundraisers is a Foals of Penn State calendar um, where they go out and they, they get pictures of the foals and then we put together a calendar and sell them as a fundraiser. So if anybody's looking for a calendar, hint, hint. So why do we use these horses or why do we have the horses on campus? You know, we're fortunate that, you know, we have, we actually are able to use the horses for all three of the missions at Penn State. They're probably used the most for the undergraduate program. Um, when I was a student at Penn State, that's about all they were used for was, was teaching. There was a little bit of research and then extension done. Um, we've, we've really grown the program over the years uh, and we've got more classes that we're offering. Our extension programs are really ramped up both on the adult side and the youth side. And we have extension or research faculty that like to use the horses for some relatively non-invasive type research programs. As far as the classes that we teach, uh, we teach a lot of horse classes, everything from basic horse production and management uh, to horse handling and training. We teach two levels of horse judging, introductory horse judging and advanced horse judging. Um, there is the broodmare and foal class that students actually spend a lot of time. In fact, this morning we were going through their project because starting in about when they come back to in-person classes, they're gonna be out at the barn checking mares uh, to try to get uh, the foals born. Um, we teach a marketing class uh, that really coordinates our annual sale. And then we also have advanced classes in uh, breeding farm and breeding farm management and reproduction, equine advanced nutrition and advanced equine exercise physiology, as well as in equine facilitated therapy course where students learn about that side of the industry. So one of the things that we've really grown into in our program is to try to give students an opportunity to learn about and experience as many different sides of the industry as they possibly can. You know, we are not a, what you would call a traditional horseback riding university because we deal with a breeding program. Uh, there is a riding picture, I see that, but um, you know, the horse, the, the students are learning about the science of production and management. So equine nutrition, equine reproduction, equine exercise physiology. And then they, they also learn about the other sides of the industry like the facilitated therapy, marketing, which goes into everything. So we're trying to provide our students with not only a well-rounded education, but also an education that they can become very specialized in uh, for when they move on in their careers. We have student clubs. Uh, the two main horse clubs are the CHAPS, which is the Collegiate Horsemen Association at Penn State and the Penn State Equine Research Team. Uh, the research team is, is basically what it sounds like. They don't compete, but uh, they, they develop smaller research projects that undergraduates can perform. Um, a lot of those are on growth and development. They help the graduate students in our department with their research programs. So when we have equine graduate students, the research team will oftentimes help them. 
CHAPS does a variety of events. Um, it's mostly just a horse interest club. Students get to go to the farm and, you know, help groom mares and help. They, they work a lot with our sale horses as well. Uh, they provide that if you look down in this bottom, that's a good example of our meet a farm animal day where um, I think their first and second grade kids come to campus in the spring, in a normal spring. Uh, and visit with horses and sheep and cattle and just learn about the agricultural industries. And that's what our student clubs are. We also have students who participate in the, the more traditional um, livestock clubs on campus, like the Block and Bridal Club and even the Dairy Science Club um, that, are, that have been around for forever that maybe some of you are familiar with if you were, in Penn, if you were at Penn State back in the um, early before CHAPS and PCERT was created. Other opportunities that our students have because we have the horses on campus, um, you know, they get to participate in our sale, which is, you know, a real life marketing program where they interact with industry people and, and get to see our horses move on in their careers. We do have a, a number of students who stay around in the summer that help prepare horses. Some of our young horses for show, there's a local fraternity, the, the Pennsylvania Quarter Horse Association fraternity, not far from here, that students will take our horses to and, and compete. They get to help with foaling, which sounds like a lot of fun until it's two o'clock in the morning on a Friday night and you had other plans. Um, student research projects, they get to show against one another in the little eye. And then I'm the coach, but uh, they also can compete on the Penn State horse judging team. Uh, we have riding teams. They're all inter, uh, intercollegiate horse show association teams. We have a, a hunt seat team, a Western team and a dressage team that compete nationally. As far as our research programs, uh, Dr. Birch Stanier and Dr. Danielle Smarsh are our primary researchers, although when a research project's going on, a lot of us get involved. Um, primary interest areas uh, for research in our department is equine nutrition, growth and development. And with uh, Dr. Smarsh is relatively new. And one of the things that she's adding to our research program along with Dr. Stanier is exercise physiology. I've even included a picture. I'll show you a picture again later, but um, we just, just completed a, a new piece to our facility, which is a six horse equisizer that they're going to be using for some of their exercise physiology research. <clears throat> our extension programs, we have extremely uh, well developed youth extension programs, always have our 4-H system in Pennsylvania is tremendous. Uh, Andrea Coker coordinates that program, but we also have um, Lou Trumbull, uh, Joe Stanko, and Bethany Bickle who work very closely in all the programs, plus there's people scattered it in each county of, of the state uh, that work with 4-H and youth. Our adult extension program is developed very well. Dr. Danielle Smarsh runs that along with her cohort, and they do a variety of programs out not only in this area, but across the entire state and region. As far as our facilities are concerned, you know, this is something I'm sure a lot of you, if you've been back to campus or when you were here, um, they're pretty close to campus. And we're very fortunate that our students can actually walk from campus to our barn if they desire to do that. It's not that far. Uh, our, what we call our old barn uh, is pictured here. Uh, two angles. One is from Park Avenue and the other one is from down, down below uh, looking up at the stadium. You can see it's directly across the street from the stadium. Uh, this new, we actually just added a new wing on the old barn. There used to be a, a wing out there and then a couple of years ago it was condemned. Um, we've since got it rebuilt. They added some stalls and you can see on the back side some stall doors and the front side is, is just running lots. We're very fortunate to have that. Um, our horses become rather desensitized to noise during football season. Uh, whenever there's 110,000 people screaming directly across the street, they get to be pretty used to a lot of loud noises. Between that and the fireworks, they're pretty good. We also have what we refer to as our new barn. And perhaps some of you may have been in our program and graduated back in the 70s, and you may be thinking, wow, the new barn, that was built when I was there. This barn was actually opened in 1972, uh, but we call it the new barn because, well, it's still newer than the old barn. Uh, the old barn that we showed was, was actually, part of it was moved from up here on the main part of campus. I believe that was back in 
1929 time frame, um, and they've added on to it since then. So this new barn is our main barn. This is where the office is. This is where we try to get all of our mares to fall. We have student quarters in here. There's two students that live in this barn. Then there's a house up by our dairy barn where two other students are assigned to the horse barn live. Um, so this is what we would call our main working barn. And then here's a picture of our equisizer that I mentioned kind of earlier. You can sort of see where it's located in relation to the stadium. Um, again, brand new, it's only been used once or twice. It's gonna really help. Uh, if you're not familiar with an equisizer, what it is is there's a, there's a circle inside of that that is, uh, it has stalls or six basically stalls that move in a circular way and it's all automated. So you can put a horse in there and, and it'll exercise them. So if you're familiar with the old hot walkers or if you're familiar with bull studs that have hot walkers, they're not attached to it in any way, they're loose, but they're able to exercise in a circular way uh, and kind of um, be maintained that way if necessary. So, I kind of went through that fast and I did that intentionally because I wanted to leave lots of time for questions. I would say that if you're really interested and you're on Facebook, the Penn State Quarter Horses page is a rather active Facebook page. A lot of our students post on there and you know, whenever we have new babies born, they post pictures of the babies. They advertise our horse sale and uh, all of our sale horses are on there with videos whenever we get to that point. So if you're on Facebook and you like to keep up with Penn State stuff, Go ahead and like the Penn State Quarter Horse page, um, and then you'll be able to kind of keep up with some of the things that that is going on around here in our program. Does anybody have any questions, or how? I'm, I think we just get questions asked. I'm going to stop my share, and then we'll go on from there. Great, thanks so much, Brian. We have a lot of questions coming in. Um, let's first start with. Um, I know that the farm has uh, visiting policies, and they've changed over the years. Um, first of all, how can somebody who wants to come out to the farm or out to the barn, how do they visit? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, things have changed over the years, you know, back in the day, people could just walk around. Um, the truth is though, is that we, it's still very much an open facility. There's a, there's a sign at the top of the road that says biosecurity area, keep out. Um, but that was put there back in the time when we were struggling with hoof and mouth disease. And, you know, it's not as big a problem now. So we do allow people to come visit the farm. And we ask that they do not open stalls, they do not go in pastures, and they definitely do not feed the horses anything. But people that want to come out and see uh, the horses, you know, we don't discourage that unless they become a problem. Now we do lock things up on home football weekends, um, just for the sheer volume, you know, there's just so many people and 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 then of course you know there's some activities going on on home football weekends that we need to keep out of the barn anyway so but we do encourage people to come and visit you know i don't know if you know what the what the numbers are but you know in the spring of the year with our foals we are very popular a lot of people like to come see the babies and i and i welcome you if you're in town you want to come down to the barn like i said we don't we don't want you opening stalls we don't want you feeding the horses or going in pastures or, and we would actually prefer you don't even try to pet the animals because particularly with stallions, you don't know which ones might nip at you. Yeah. So um, a bunch of different questions coming in about if we ever auction off uh, any of any of the horses. Um, well, what do you do for mares who aren't breeding anymore? Are they auctioned off? Um, foals that are bred at Penn State, do they stay here or do they get auctioned off? Uh, so talk a little bit about what happens uh, with, with some of our horses. Are they available for auction? Yeah, that's a, I'd, I'd like to address that. Um, so this spring, we will have our 19th student run sale. Um, prior to that time, the horses were sold through a modified private treaty way. Um, but for the past 19 years, we've had a public auction. Mostly the horses that we sell at that public auction are two-year-olds. So we, we, the babies that are born on the farm, we use them, um, weanlings, yearlings, two-year-olds to help with our, uh, our undergraduate education programs. We help, they help with some of our growth and development research, our extension programs, things like that. Usually in their two-year-old year, year uh, I teach a handling and training class in spring semester. 
the horses are started under saddle and, and started along that, and then we auction them off. Um, <laughs> last year, we had to kind of do an about face. You know, we always had an in-person auction at the Ag Arena. There'd be four or 500 people show up and we'd, we'd give them lunch and tour the farm and show them the stallions and all the mares and the other babies. Well, of course, last year with COVID. Uh, and I have to be honest and tell you, our students are phenomenal. We went from full bore in-person auction to 100% online and we actually had our highest average sale of all time. Um, so this year we're going online again with our auction and we're offering all of our young horses, two-year-olds. We might put some yearlings in. Um, if anybody's interested, prohorseservices.com is the website for the company that we work with. Uh, they are one of the best auction companies in the country and they help us out a lot financially, but they, they do a great job. Last year, we had bidder numbers in 36 states and three countries, uh, and we had over 120,000 people visit our sale page. So one of the really neat things about our sale is it, it is student run. So I have student sale managers, assistant managers. We have a marketing class that helps be all the behind the scenes stuff. And, you know, they, they do everything from maintaining a website to our Facebook posts and marketing advertising, creating a catalog. So the students are fully engaged. The broodmare question, you know, we, we haven't really included mares in our sale. Um, a lot of that's because they're hard to market. A lot of people don't want mares, especially non-reproductively sound mares. And that is one of the biggest, not biggest, but it is a problem that we face. You know, we breed mares and then when they get up to be 18, 19, 20 years old, we really don't want to breed them anymore. Um, so they, one of a couple of things happens to them. One, they enter into our teaching program where they, you know, cause they're still healthy and they're great with the kids and so forth. Two, we rehome them. Um, two, we just sent a, a mare back to the people that donated her to us. They donated her to us 15 years ago. We used her as a brood mare. And when we were done, they said, we'll take her back. So other mares go to former students or people that are looking for a pasture pet or a pasture companion for another <laughs> horse. We don't usually market them because we really want to be careful where they go. We don't want to just put them up for sale and have somebody take them to a not good place. Um, people are wondering about, so, um, so if you're a first time uh, purchaser of a horse, what would, what would you look for? <clears throat> That's, that's a tough one. A first time purchaser of a horse. If you are not a horse person necessarily, and you're trying to buy a horse, what I would look for is I would look for an older animal that's much more experienced. Uh, a horse, you know, uh, not to genderize it, but maybe a gelding. Um, a gelding is a castrated male. They're a little bit more low key. You know, they're the same every day. Uh, mares sometimes can be a little bit different uh, different times and so forth. And obviously stallions can be aggressive, but maybe a 10, 12 year old gelding that's that's been through a lot, has been very highly trained and just quiet, easy to get along with, less likely to be reactive. I mean, let's be honest, they're animals. So, you know, any even the gentlest one of all can wake up on the wrong side of the stall, so to speak. But if I was looking for one for somebody that that didn't have a lot of experience and it was the first horse, I would look for an older kind of a trooper that's been there, done that, and then recommend professional help, like get, get help from somebody that um, has a lot more experience. Yeah. So how do you come up with the names for the horses? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. You know, one of the things that when I started, uh, when I took over the breeding program, one of the things that I decided to do was all the babies born at our farm now the first three letters of their name are PSU. So that no matter where they go, how old they get, if they're in Texas, California, we sent one to Washington State last year, they know where they came from. Uh, but um, the names, oh, it's hard. We, we oftentimes will try to use some aspect of the stallion's name and some aspect of the mayor's name and put them together so that people know their genetic makeup by looking at their names. But that can be hard. You know, if you think about the fact that we have these mares, 
we have one mayor this year, I'm looking at our foaling list, it's right behind the computer, that's going to have her 14th foal. And, you know, she's only been bred to two different stallions. So it's really hard to come up with a new name right. that's representative. So uh, some of it becomes kind of a play on words and some of it the students help with. And um, when we used to have an open house with our chaps and uh, P-Cert Club, we would have a name the fold contest where we would have a foal and a staller in a pen and everybody that was there could fill out a form and they could come up with a name. We'd give them the rules. The American Quarter Horse Association can only, you can only have 20 letters and spaces total. Okay. No numbers, no, you know, anything like that. So it, it, it can become kind of challenging. Uh, some people are wondering kind of what's the average cost for a horse and at what age are they sold? Of our horses? Yes. Um, most of our horses are two years of age when we sell them. We do market some as yearlings. Um, oftentimes we market yearlings private treaty uh, and we'll get anywhere from $8,500 to $12,000 for one of those. Uh, last year, our sale was the highest averaging sale and we averaged $7,800 a head. The range on that was 4,000 to 12,000. Um, now, that kind of shows, you know, we, we've been fortunate over the past 15, 20 years to really ramp up our breeding program. The first year we had a student run auction, we averaged $1,600 a head on wow. nine head. So we went from $1,600 on nine head to $7,800 on 13 head last year. Wow. So our quality's really gone up there. Absolutely. So uh, people are asking about the name quarter horse and, and what the, where that comes from. And uh, what is, what is the, the purpose of a quarter horse? You know, listening to your presentation, it sounds like they're working horses or performance horses. Tell us a little bit about the name origin and what the, what the real world use for these horses are. Well, originally the quarter horse was developed. It's like I said, it's an American breed and it, it actually has its name because they, they were ranch horses that um, cowboys would, would use and they started breeding them rather selectively. And they came up with a group or a breeding line that was especially quick and fast and they would win if, if you've watched Western movies, you know, they used to have quarter mile races around town whenever they were partying or whatever. Right. And these were the horses that were best uh, served for the quarter mile race. So that's where they get their name, the quarter horse, because they run a quarter mile. In fact, even today, there is a subset of quarter horses that are racing bred. We don't have any of those specifically, but there are still quarter horse racing uh, quarter horse races that are a quarter mile. In fact, some of the largest purses for individual races are in the quarter horse industry. But then, so those horses were uh, bred and used on ranches for cattle work, you know, roping, um, rounding up cows, things like that. Nowadays, we're a much more diversified breed and the quarter horse will do just about anything. We've still got cow horses. We've stuck, still got ranch horses. We have a lot of what I call light performance horses, which uh, horses are just like Western Pleasure or Hunter Under Saddle, which is a lot slower, not quite as athletic. But we also have jumping horses and uh, driving horses. So there, there is a full gamut of horses that are in the quarter horse breed now. Uh, they've been crossed with thoroughbreds and things along that line. But originally they were ranch horses. So let's talk a little bit about the, the program. Uh, first of all, how many students do you have in your program today? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I can give you rough numbers. So yeah. in our animal, I think in our animal science major, we're probably looking at about 400 students in our major. Wow. Um, and then we have, we have an equine science minor. We do not have an equine science major. Um, and we want it that way. You know, we like that our animals or our equine science students, a lot of them are animal science students as well. Um, our equine science minor, usually we can track about 125 students or so. Um, it's hard to track minors because students don't have to declare their minor until they're, you know, they can't declare it until they're sophomores. Right. We have a lot of freshmen that we consider to be part of our minor but they're not official so we track i think around 125 um, minor students each year but as a for instance 
our marketing class and our marketing program, it's not uncommon to have 70 to 80 students involved in our sale in one way or another. So, wow. you know, it's, it's a pretty active program. Yeah, I would imagine the courses probably fill up pretty quickly in this program, right? Uh, most years. This year, it's been not quite as much because of the uh, a lot of our courses have a hands-on component. So with COVID, you know, and especially we're, we're doing a lot of um, remote learning. So there are students who've decided to not take some of the horse classes this year in hopes that they'll go back to normal for next year. Right. So, um, so the students who minor in this program, what kind of careers do they go on to? Well, <clears throat> We only go to one, right? Okay. <laughs> so, the interesting thing about the minor is, I, I would I would say that we we have a tremendous spectrum of students that that take our minor. We have, you know, yes, the bulk of our students are from the College of Agricultural Sciences, not necessarily animal science, but in the College of Ag. But we also have students from education and the Smeal School of Business that take our minor, and and you you've got that spectrum of the horse is a different kind of an animal. It's not like some of your tr more, uh, you know, known livestock species, but you have people that take our horse classes and our equine minor just because they're, they're horse people. So they may, they may not have a career in the horse industry, but they just want to learn about them. But we also have students that go out into, into just about every aspect of the horse industry. Um, because of our our focus being on equine nutrition and equine um, reproduction and exercise physiology. You know, our students are very well geared to go into the equine nutrition field. Uh, we have a lot of our students, of course, that want to go on and be veterinarians. Um, the reproduction field is an area that we've really grown. There was a there's a place down in Maryland called Select Breeder Services, which is they've got two sides. They got a stallion side and a mare side. Um, the stallion side, they do a lot of frozen semen work and collection of stallions. The mare side, they do a lot of embryo transfer stuff. Last year, they had nine employees. Six of them graduated from our program. Um, you know, so those are the types of jobs. But we have students that go out and they're professional horse trainers. We have students that are uh, barn managers. They own their own farms. We have students that go on to law school and become lawyers. Um, in, in ag law, in, you know, equine law or ag law. So the, the, where our students go is really diversified, perhaps more diverse than a lot of our other programs. We have students that get into politics uh, as right. far as, you know, because these politicians, they don't all know much about ag. So they're looking for people that can kind of help guide them so they lo don't look as foolish all the time. Um, and, and, you know, those are some of the things that we can guide our students into. We have students that go to grad school, of course, and uh, that's a really tough question to answer. We have one, in fact, she came and talked to the marketing class last night. That's, you know, a professional horse photographer. Uh, and she travels and does take pictures of horse shows and, and so forth and so on. So, you know, our major prepare students for a variety of things, pharmaceutical sales, feed sales, uh, veterinary services, things along that line. So um, I have seen where, um, where horses have been used in um, equine assisted therapy for physical and emotional benefits. Um, if that's not part of the program now, do you see that as maybe a future direction for the program? You know, that is a, that is a part of our industry and we do offer a class in equine facilitated therapy. Students work with a local uh, facilitated therapy program. Uh, we don't necessarily do that thing on campus. We have discussed it though, to be truthful, um, but it would require a complete revamping of our program or finances to add on to the program because we wouldn't, the, the horses that you use for that are so different than the young horses that we have and the, the breeding horses that we have. It would have to be a, a, a complete subset of its own. We have talked about it and we just don't really at this point have the facilities or the faculty that are able to administer that program at a, yeah. at a high degree. Um, so the way we offer it a little bit is to have that advanced equine facilitated therapy class and the students are working with a local program. So a couple quick hitter questions here. Nancy wants to know, do you still have the little international show? 
yes, the Little Eye and the Dairy Expo are still going on. They did not have it last year because of COVID. Um, I don't know if it's going to occur this year because of COVID, but yes, it is still definitely on the books. Um, it's still a very popular program. Uh, we've just been in a little bit of a break in the last couple of years. Yeah. Are quarter horses the only horses at Penn State? Now, yes. Um, we used to have Morgans. We used to have Arabians. Um, and they were there was a little bit of intertwining there for a while. But right now, they're all quarter horses, except that one stallion that I showed you, the stallion that was born here, PSU, he rocks the night. Right. He's actually double registered. He's an American quarter horse, but he's also an American paint horse. So he's, he has two sets of registration papers. Some people are talking about classes that they've had with Ward Studebaker back in the 70s. Uh, what, where is Ward nowadays? Ward and his wife, Margie, live at their home down in Coburn, Pennsylvania. Uh, Ward retired back in 2000. Um, he's still active. You know, he, he still comes and, you know, makes sure I'm doing things right. You know, Ward and I are very close. Um, between the horses and Ward, they, they, I could say 90% of my equine knowledge has been taught to me through either Ward Studebaker or the horses themselves. Um, and a lot of people that came through this program between when he was man, he was manager of our farm for 33 years. Wow. And a lot of people that came through our program during that time have a very close tie with Ward. In fact, um, we have the uh, Ward Studebaker Horse Farm Endowment, which some uh, friends of the program started where they, they wanted to honor Ward. And that is an endowment that helps to provide some funding <laughs> for, our, um, for our program. Um, we'd like to see that grow, but you know, so that, that is, that is how important Ward Studebaker is to the quarter horse program at Penn State. So um, over the, the 30 years that you've been working uh, with the program, what are the biggest changes in the quarter horse breed and uh, what are the biggest changes in the industry? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's, that's really a hard thing. I, I, to me, the biggest change in the breed itself is just the sheer size um, and the, the extreme nature. You know, it seems like we've, we've still got those ranch horses that are the extreme ranch horse, and we have the hunter horses that are the extreme hunter horses. When I was younger, when I was coming up through the program, so to speak, the horses were more versatile. They were more all around. Now, now I see our breed as more fragmented and more um, kind of like dog breeds where, you know, uh, the, you have the bird dogs and you have the rabbit dogs, but they don't necessarily mix and they can't do both. You know, the quarter horses used to be a little bit more all around. Now they're, I think, a little bit too specialized in some cases. Um, but that's my opinion. The industry itself, I think the biggest difference in the industry for me is the money. Um, it's become such an expensive hobby. And, you know, the, that diversity in the breed itself has really caused the diversity of the people. Um, but it's also more far reaching. So, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So a uh, specific question about the genetic HYPP mm -hmm. blood test for seizures. Um, you've heard some quarter host horses are prone to. Jennifer's interested in, in hearing more about that. Yeah, so HYPP, hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. It's actually a defect in the calcium ion chains that affect muscles. Um, and it is a, a disease, a genetic disorder that has been discovered in the quarter horse back in the, I'm gonna say the 80s or late 70s, early 80s. Um, there, it is still in the breed, although it is a lot less common than it used to be. Uh, that because of genetic testing, we have been able to select it out of the breed somewhat. Um, in fact, there's some regulations about it now where you can't have a double, like it's, it's, a, it's a typical genetic disorder, but you have varying degrees. So if they get one gene or two genes really determines how severe it can be. So you can't register a, a horse that has both genes now and um, most people are selecting it out of their breeding program completely. Uh, and because of our genetic testing, but HYPP is not the only problem in the quarter horse 
breed. There are a lot of genetic disorders in all horse breeds and our science has become so good that we can, uh, all stallions in the quarter horse industry have to be genetic tested so that people know what they're breeding to. Um, and if there is a disorder, like uh, honestly, one of our stallions has uh, one of the recessive disorders and knowing that really helps because we have tested all of our mares and we require people breeding to that stallion test their mares. And as long as they, the mare doesn't have the problem, we can have success in that breed pairing. Um, so the ability for us to do the genetic testing, and that's probably beyond the scope of that question, but <laughs> HYPP is, is a problem because it causes, you know, involuntary muscle twitches. It promotes a lot of muscle growth. But the problem with that is that that sounds all wonderful and everything, except when you consider that the muscle or the heart is a muscle. So right. if you have a, you know, a problem with muscle, now you have a problem with the heart and you can run into some long-term uh, health issues with those horses. So Jenna is thinking of coming to Penn State, possibly uh, before large animal vet schooling. Where do most students attend vet school after four years at Penn State? wherever they can get in. No, right. uh, <laughs> um, that again, very variable, you know, a lot of our in-state students, you know, try to attend University of Pennsylvania down in Philadelphia, because right. that's our in-state vet school. But we, we have a really good reputation with a lot of the vet schools. Um, we have students at Ohio State, uh, Virginia, Maryland, out in the West, and in all the schools out there. Um, we even, you know, we have a, we have a, in our program, we have a cooperative deal with the University of Glasgow, uh, where students can do their last year of undergrad while doing their first year of vet school at the University of Glasgow. So we, we truly send students everywhere. The last year, I know we got students into Cal Poly, Wisconsin, Penn, Virginia, Maryland, Ross, you know, all over the, all over the globe actually, because we do send students to overseas as well. So Christina wants to know how might environmental changes, rising temperatures, global warming uh, impact quarter horses and their success in breeding? Oh boy, <laughs> you guys are tough. Um, that's a great question. You know, I, and I, I don't know the answer to it. You know, I, I one of the things that, you know, I, I don't think it would affect our breeding a whole lot because mares and stallions are affected more by photo period than temperature. So, you know, unless we start getting longer days, you know, it's not going to change how they breed or when they breed. But I can see where um, climate change, where I see more of a problem with that is with some of our um, diseases or even our pests, you know, because we're not, we're not having the hard kills in the winter. So you have more uh, insects and, and things along that line. I can see that becoming more of a problem before I see reproductive issues. Great. So um, as you look forward for the next five years of the program, what are some of the things that you're most excited about? Retirement? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a joke, but not really. Um, for the program, what I'm most excited about is just the continued growth and support. You know, we we have we have a really good uh, support system in the industry, and we also get great support from our administrators. Um, you know, now that may change, but for the next five years, you know, we've we've added some new facilities. We've added onto our old barn. We got that equisizer. You know, I'd like to see more growth in our facilities. I'd, our, the popularity of our horses, you know, the national publicity that we get through our horses and, you know, the ability to produce world champions and so forth. And why do I think that's important? I think that's important from a recruitment standpoint, if nothing else, and, and, a, and a visibility. You know, when we have horses in Arizona and California and Texas, and, and they're being shown at a very high level as some of the best horses in the world, um, that recruits students to our program. Uh, that helps to bring dollars into our program. So that's where I, I get excited. I get excited by that, that marketing aspect of, of what we're doing now. People are wondering about employment opportunities. You've got people excited about the barns and about the quarter horses. If they're interested in working maybe as a vet tech 
in the quarter horse program or other areas of the quarter horse program? How can they find that information? You know, those types of jobs at Penn State, you know, they don't come up very often. You know, most, mm -hmm. most people that come to Penn State stay at Penn State. It's a great place to work. Uh, really, the, the best way to find out about opportunities at the university is just through the Penn State jobs jobs website and I don't, I don't know the exact website off the top of my head but you know it all jobs are posted through that undergraduate students that are are here or plan to come here you know um we do hire most of our help at the farm is students uh we have about 12 to 14 students that work at the farm every semester we have two full-time people um so you know students can can apply at the farm but for outsiders the best thing to do is just kind of keep their eyes on uh, Penn State jobs and see because if not in our program, you know we there are other facilities we have we have a full fully operational livestock facilities uh, in our department because we have dairy cattle beef cattle sheep hogs white tail deer um, right. so we're you know poultry um, so they can you know just kind of keep their eyes open and, and try to be flexible. If people want more information about your program or if there's um... If they want to be supportive of your program philanthropically, where can they go to find that information? Our animal sciences website uh, has a facilities page and on that facilities, you can get down to all of the facilities, including our horse farm. Um, the, if they're interested in helping out financially, uh, the probably the, unless they want to start their own endowment, which we would not frown upon, um, the Studebaker endowment is there to be used, you know, and that is something that uh, there is a link on our website that they can find out about that or go through the College of Ag Development. Um, and, you know, honestly, with today's, in today's day and age, sustainability of any of our farms on campus becomes more and more and more and more challenging. Um, you know, and, and it is a reality that we face. It's also why we work so hard to try to produce the best darn horses we can. Because when you can say we sell them for ten thousand dollars now instead of two thousand, you know that helps right. to offset the cost. But because we're in the field of education, it's also we also do it a very expensive way. Um, we're trying to educate students, so it's an expensive proposition. That is wonderful. The links for those websites that Brian has been referring to um, all throughout the program are in the chat box. So. Make sure that you look in the chat and uh, visit those websites. Brian, thank you so much for joining us on the virtual speaker series. It was great to have you today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It was been great. I love, I love talking about our program. And I want to thank everybody who has Zoomed in with us. As a reminder, we'll be hosting additional speaker sessions in the coming weeks and months. All of that can be found on our website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thank you again. And we are... Sorry, Penn State. <laughs> I muted myself. <laughs>